With regard to food shortage, yes, we did re re talk about food shortages. And, uh, and it's going to be real. The, the price of these sanctions is not just imposed upon Russia. It's imposed upon an awful lot of countries as well, including European countries and our country as well. And uh, because both uh, Russia and Ukraine have been the breadbasket of Europe in terms of wheat, for example, just give one example. But we had a long discussion uh, in the G7 with, uh, um, the, uh, with both uh, the United States, which has a, as a significant, the third largest producer of wheat in the world, as well as Canada, which is also a major, major producer. And we both talked about how we could increase and disseminate more rapidly food, sh food shortages. And in addition to that, we talked about uh, urging all the European countries and everyone else to end trade restrictions on, on sending uh, lim limitations on sending food abroad. And so we are in the process of working out with our European friends what it would be, what it would take to help alleviate the concerns relative to uh, food shortages. We also talked about a significant major U.S. investment, among others, in terms of providing for the need for humanitarian assistance, including food, as we move forward. What's up, everybody? It is 8 o'clock in Athens. That would make it 8 o'clock in Kiev and 9 o'clock in Moscow. This is my morning update for Friday. And uh, we got a lot of uh, news to get to. First, you saw the, uh, the video of Joe Biden at the NATO summit, and he's talking about the fact that there are going to be food shortages. And uh, he, he touched upon wheat. He used wheat as an example. And he said, yes, there's going to be food shortages and people are going to suffer because for some reason, these elites have decided that Russia must uh, undergo a color revolution and a regime change. And so they sanctioned the crap out of Russia. And uh, well, now the everyday average citizen is going to have to pay a price for that. And uh, Biden is basically saying that there's going to be wheat shortages. But don't worry, everybody, because Joe Biden and Justin Trudeau are on the case. In other words, the United States and Canada, they're going to ramp up their wheat production. And they are going to solve this wheat shortfall because Russia is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, exporter of wheat. Russia and Ukraine is definitely the biggest exporters of wheat. But, uh, you know, Biden is telling everybody in the U.S., in Canada, in Europe, do not worry. Do not worry because Biden and Trudeau are on the case. They're going to solve this. I'm sure that makes everybody feel good, right? Biden and Trudeau are going to solve this, uh, this wheat problem. And then when they solve the wheat problem, they can solve the gas, the oil, the nickel, the fertilizer, the potash, the palladium, the titanium. <laughs> then, they, then they can solve all the other problems. But just let Biden and Trudeau figure out the wheat thing. So that was a statement from Joe Biden at this NATO conference. Uh, the NATO conference, basically, they said uh, Stoltenberg, by the way, is not going to go to the central bank in, um, I believe, Norway. He was up for the job of uh, central bank head in Norway. He is now, his uh, term as NATO chief has been extended for one more year because of everything that's going on. He's been a very good puppet, so he will uh, stay at NATO for one more year. NATO said that they're not going to uh, impose a no-fly zone. They said they're not going to put troops in Ukraine. And uh, Stoltenberg and Biden once again started to throw out the chemical weapons rhetoric, which means that they still have this chemical weapons false flag on their mind, or they're still trying to, to orchestrate some sort of chemical weapons false flag. Because Biden made these statements and Stoltenberg made these statements. It's on their mind. It's in their head. It's on the script. And they're reading the script and they're saying, false flag, chemical weapons. Keep on prepping the public. Keep on prepping those NPCs about a chemical weapons false flag. And if uh, and about chemical weapons, which is going to be a false flag. And if those chemical weapons happen in Ukraine, well, then Russia is responsible and that'll be the pretext for some sort of escalation. So they still have that false flag uh, cooking. They haven't given it up yet because everything else 
seems to have been uh, discarded. No troops, no no-fly zone. There's absolutely nothing that NATO can realistically do to change the, uh, the outcome on the ground and the inevitable defeat of, uh, of the Ukraine military, which is uh, what I would say right now a certainty at this point in time. We have news about uh, Izium, which is this city in Donbass, which has been taken by the Russian Federation, which means they can squeeze that Donbass uh, Ukraine army, that encirclement, that cauldron even tighter, those 60, 70,000 troops in that cauldron in Donbass, they're going to be squeezed even tighter now that the Russians have full control of, uh, of this very important key city. We had news yesterday about Mariupol being uh, taken by the Russian Federation, the Russian military and the Chechen military there. Um, I can't confirm this 100%, but I can confirm that more sectors have been cleared of these Azov guys and that uh, the Russian military, the Donbass militia, and the Chechen uh, soldiers are going uh, through these sectors and they're just, they're taking out these Azov guys, to put it mildly, they're just taking them out. There's no more negotiation, no more police surrender, none of that stuff. They're just going from apartment to apartment, block to block, sector to sector, and they're taking them out and they're mopping up the very, very center of Mariupol. So whether it's fully liberated today or tomorrow, take it to the bank. Mariupol is, is now uh, under Russian uh, control. And so what else did you have? So you had the NATO summit, you had the statements from NATO, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, rolled out the EU's LNG and energy plan, and it's called Repower EU. So they got this really, really cool and nifty slogan, Repower EU. And the plan is going to be to get uh, LNG tankers from the United States to Europe. And that's going to fill the, the, energy, the energy LNG shortfall that the sanctions have, uh, have imposed on Europe. Now, where these LNG tankers are going to dock, I don't know, because Europe doesn't have those, uh, those terminals, LNG terminals ready. And boy, are they going to need a lot of them. I mean, a lot of them. And uh, they don't pop up overnight. But, uh, you know, Ursula von der Leyen is on the case. The, the most unsuccessful German defense minister in history. She was a complete failure as Germany's defense minister. And she was promoted up to be the chief of the EU. She's on the case. She calls it repower the EU. And so we're gonna have all these LNG tankers going from the US to the EU, and they're gonna dock in, in what is now imaginary terminals. And this is gonna cover the energy uh, shortfall from the sanctions imposed on Russia. And of course, as EU citizens, all of us are going to pay 10 times more for our energy. Our energy costs are gonna rise 10X, if not more. And I just wonder, is, uh, is Europe going to, uh, to subsidize those uh, energy increases? Because you have truckers in Spain who are protesting because of the increasing price for, for fuel. And Spain's answer to all of that was, we'll give you money, we'll subsidize it. We'll subsidize the, uh, the increase. In other words, we're going to print more euros. So is that the solution? Is a solution to, to say, you know what, Mr. EU citizen or Mr. EU business, you're paying 100, 100 euros right now for your uh, gas. It's going to go up to 1,000. But uh, because we have to stick it to Putin and uh, we have to punish Russia, because obviously it's all about Ukraine, which is not a member of the European Union and not a member of NATO, but... Let's not talk about the fact that Ukraine is not an EU member or is not a member of NATO. You're going to pay 10x more in your energy bill and we're going to subsidize that. So we'll give you 900 euros to cover the cost. In other words, we'll just print those euros. Is that the solution to all of this? Because I don't see how any small, medium or large business is going to stay open or be competitive after this price increase. I don't see how everyday people in Greece are gonna be able to cover the increase of, uh, of their energy costs, given the fact that we're gonna be bringing in LNG from the United States. 
I don't see it, but I don't think we should worry because Ursula von der Leyen and her repower EU plan is going to, uh, to solve everything. <laughs> Boris Johnson is going crazy trying to, trying to confiscate Russia's gold, by the way. I mean, he is like pulling his hair trying to figure out a way to get to Russia's 200 billion in gold. Boy, oh boy, do the, uh, do the puppet masters of Boris want that gold. You know it. You know that the puppet masters of Boris Johnson have told him, find a way to confiscate that 200 billion. It's like 150, 200 billion in gold that the Russians have. And Boris is running around like a chicken without a head, trying to figure out a way to confiscate, to confiscate that gold. So at a minimum, what the uh, US and UK are trying to do is they're trying to make it hard for Russia to, uh, to use that gold. They're trying to, to, to make it so that Russia won't be able to, uh, to use those gold reserves if they need to. Not that they need to, because keep in mind that the Russians are making upwards of a billion uh, euros a day selling their gas and their oil to the EU at this very moment. And pretty soon that's going to be a payment made in rubles because the EU have been deemed unfriendly countries by, uh, by the Russian government. By the way, uh, Germany has said that they're not going to uh, comply with paying for their energy in rubles. Olaf Scholz told uh, the media and told the press that Germany will not pay rubles for gas. So Olaf Scholz all of a sudden found his, uh, found his backbone. He found his spine, right? He kowtowed to Biden. He went along with these destructive sanctions, which are going to destroy the German economy. And all of a sudden, he's found a way to talk tough to, to the Russians and say, no, we don't agree. We are not going to pay rubles for gas. He's basically saying that the fact that the Russians are saying, pay us rubles for, for the gas breaks the contract. Okay, fine. If, uh, if he doesn't want to pay for, those rub for, the, for that gas in rubles, I guess Germany can find their, uh, their LNG elsewhere at this very moment or when that long-term contract runs out. I don't know when that contract runs out, say in six months, say in a year, Germany's gonna have to find a different solution to fill their energy needs, of which I believe Germany is on the hook with Russian gas for, Russian gas for something like 40% of their uh, energy needs. So I mean, Germany needs Russian gas, big time, in a big, big way. They are, they are the most exposed country in Europe to, uh, to Russian energy supplies. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Olaf Schultz is talking tough, make no mistake about it. In six months to a year, when German businesses close up, when they can no longer be competitive on the world market, which they won't be competitive, and, uh, and German citizens either have to pay 10 times more for their energy uh, needs or they end up just freezing, well, then Olaf Scholz is going to run to the Kremlin and he's going to beg Putin to please accept rubles for this gas. That's exactly what's going to happen. Germany, in this, in this sanctions war, in this entire sanctions war, if there's one country that is the big loser in all of this, like the big loser, hands down, it is Germany. Germany is the biggest loser in this sanctions war. It's incredible to, to watch a country just take the gun to the head and just pull the trigger in such a way. It, it, it's stunning. It's stunning to watch this. But uh, it is what it is. It is what it is. Let me think. Do I have anything else that I want to talk about here? We talked about uh, a little bit about the situation on the ground. Uh, there, there was this ship that, was, uh, that sank off the off the coast of a city, of a port city called, God, Ber, Berdanitsk, I believe is the name of that city. God, I, I think I butchered it. But anyway, this, uh, this supply ship was an old Soviet type of ship, was sunk by, uh, by a Ukraine missile. What happened there is that the, uh, the Russians intercepted the missile, but uh, they, they kind of got it too late, from what I understand. And, and the missile, um, those fragments of that missile, they ignited um, some ammunition that was on that uh, on that ship, and from what I gather, uh, fire started. The ship started to uh, 
the ship was just unusable and the uh, the Russians sunk it. So this was a, I guess you could say this was a tactical a tactical win for the uh, for the Ukraine military. They they got a ship, but does it make a difference in anything? No, not at all. Doesn't make a difference whatsoever as to what's happening because the Russians are, are advancing five to 10 to 15 kilometers every single day. And they're running 300 sorties every single night. And they're grinding the, U the Ukraine military down every single day. Now with, uh, with the capture of Izum in Mariupol and the, uh, the liquidation of that cauldron in the east, well, the Russians are going to move on to, to the next phase of the military operation. You know, it's interesting when you read the military, uh, the Ministry of Defense, the military readout every day, the progress that's made and how they're reporting to, to Vladimir Putin and the Security Council in Russia. They always end their, their statements with the operation is on schedule. They either say it's on schedule or it's ahead of schedule. They say the operation is going on schedule as planned and will continue until all goals are met. And that's literally what they say in every readout. They don't really get into, into so much detail. Uh, detail. Well, they say we took out X, Y, and Z. We took out this, this many tanks and this many uh, ammo depots and we ran these many uh, sorties and they say all these things. But, you know, they don't get into this. They don't like... Uh, they don't embellish it, I guess is the right word. They don't get into like ridiculous rhetoric. You know, we took out the Ukraine army and we demolished them. And, you know, we're advancing this many kilometers and we're going to siege Kiev. And they don't get into all this stuff that you see coming out of uh, the Ukraine Ministry of Defense. They don't come up with these wild stories or anything like that. Not at all. They just say we took out 10 tanks, 10 this, 15 that, 20 that. And then at the end of their... Uh, at their briefing, they just say the operation is running. Their operation is going as scheduled and will fulfill all its goals, period. Nothing will stop us. It will fulfill all its goals. It's like, it's like you know, you, you read that and you say, okay, yeah, this is, this is game over for, uh, for Ukraine. And, uh, and Maria Zakharova said as much. And Maria Zakharova said as much. Let me get you her quote. And I think I'll leave it with Maria Zakharova's quote, because I think this says a lot as to as to what's going to be uh, happening. And uh, oh, by the way, we have some more bio lab stuff with uh, with Hunter Biden, that Rosemont Seneca was connected to these bio labs in Ukraine. Rosemont Seneca was the was this venture firm that uh, Hunter and Devin Archer and I believe Christopher Hines as well who's the stepson of John Kerry. All these guys were involved in this Rosemont Senec uh, venture firm. And they were, you know, basically this Rosemont Senec, uh, they had some, some work with this bio lab, with these bio labs as well. They had stuff going on with Burisma. Basically all these po political rich kids, they were in Ukraine just making money. But let me read you the quote from Maria Zakharova and I'll leave it, I'll leave this video there because you know, it's very telling what, uh, what she said. Very, very bad news for the, uh, the state of Ukraine, the country that we know of at this moment as Ukraine. Maria Zakharova said in a, in a press briefing, she said, they have already, she's speaking about Ukraine, they have, let me get into the shade here because, let me get under this orange tree. All right, perfect. Maria Zakharova said, Ukraine, they have already missed the main chance for the existence of Ukraine with their own borders, a sovereign Ukraine, an independent Ukraine. That's a direct quote from uh, the press, the foreign ministry press uh, spokesperson, spokeswoman for Russia. They have already missed the main chance for the existence of Ukraine within their own borders, a sovereign Ukraine, an independent Ukraine. They have already missed. What did I say in my video yesterday with regards to Kherson and that it's gone back to the ruble and, and that, you know, I can't see Russia 
giving up what they've gained and as they move towards what I believe will be as they move towards uh, Odessa and Dnipro, Dnipro Petrovsk and Kiev, I don't know. I don't know what the plan is. No one knows what the plan is, but as, uh, as Russia continues to, to move uh, westwards, I, I just don't see them giving up what they've, uh, what they've taken. I just don't see it. Maybe they will. Maybe they'll come to, uh, to a ceasefire agreement and everything will go back to something like what it was before, with the exception of Crimea, Donetsk, and Lugansk. But um, I don't see that as in the cards, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Anyway, I think I'll uh, leave it there. We covered a lot of ground, didn't we? Oh, Turkey. Here's a quick one on Turkey. The spokesperson for uh, Erdogan told, I believe, the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, told one of these publications that uh, Turkey uh, doesn't accept this whole, you know, S-400 for F-35 fighter jet deal that the U.S. was proposing. And he just basically said that the U.S., needs to stick to their promises, stick to their promises, fulfill their contractual needs by giving whatever parts are needed for the uh, F-35s, stop with their sanction nonsense, and uh, Turkey's going to proceed with uh, with doing what's in the best interest of Turkey. In other words, they're not going to give the S-400s to Ukraine. So I thought that was an interesting statement as well, because it just shows that the uh, outside of the European Union and... Uh, the EU, Canada, Australia, you know, the, the rest of the world is just, they've lost their trust in America. They've lost their trust in America, period. Whether it's on the financial side of things, the military side of things, you know, there's, there's this impression, this growing feeling in the global community that the U.S. just does not keep its word. It doesn't honor its contracts. It confiscates uh, yachts of oligarchs, it looks to, to grab gold, it goes after central bank reserves, it places sanctions on, uh, on military deals, you know, just all of these things. And the one thing's compounding onto the other, onto the other. And it's just created this, this feeling of, of distrust when dealing with the collective West. And you see it. And you see it with the fall of the of the USD, reserve currency of the petrodollar. It's there. It's a reality. Thank you, Joe Biden. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but don't worry, everybody. Biden and Trudeau, they're going to figure out the, the wheat problem, the food shortage. If not, just, uh, just follow the advice of Klaus Schwab and, and eat bugs. What a mess. What a mess. Anyway, everybody, I think I'll leave this video there. We covered a lot of ground. And uh, I'll get this video up and I'll grab a coffee and uh, stay tuned for our live. I think we're going to do a live today with Alexander on the Duran and uh, look at Alexander's channel as well. He does uh, more analysis into, into what's going on with regards to, to the uh, gas for ruble story and, and the sanctions and all these things. So just plug into his channel and you'll get a really good understanding as to what's going on on a deeper level. That is it for me, the Duran.locals.com. Take care.